Yes. Yes. My name is Colin Dan from Cardiff University. And thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you about predicting and preventing type 1 diabetes. I have talked about this at a previous meeting. So today I'm going to talk about what's new in this field and quite a lot is changing over the coming over the last year. First of all, here are my disclosures. So I'm just going to recap on some things that I said at a previous talk a year or so ago, just so that everybody is on the same page. So autoantibodies can be present for many years before the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, and they allow us to identify the early stages. So here's some of the data that shows that, and it's showing you children who are screened for autoantibodies, and those in green or in purple with two or three autoantibodies, if they were followed up for 15 years, 80% or more, in fact, closer to 90% of them later, develop type 1 diabetes. That's not true if you have only one autoantibody. And these are the kind of autoantibodies that we're looking at, shown on the right-hand side. If you go through a stage where you're dysglycemic, similar to impaired glucose tolerance in type 2 diabetes, then you're, you're progressing much more rapidly. So here are autoantibody positive children who are dysglycemic, and you can see that within five years, 90% uh, of them had already developed, not 15, but five years. So that's more, more quick progress as compared to those who are normal, in normal glucose tolerance. And this gave rise to the idea that there are three stages of type 1 diabetes. Stage three is what we tend to think of as type 1, which is when you become symptomatic and need insulin. But prior to that, there is stage two, when you have the autoantibodies and you're dysglycemic, and here you have more level, more endogenous beta cell function, usually measured by C-peptide levels. And prior to that, you have stage one, where you have autoimmune T, but normal glucose tolerance. And last time, we also talked about this study, which was reported in 2019, using the drug teplizumab, which is an anti-CD3 antibody, in stage two, so prediabetes with dysglycemia. And as a landmark trial, it demonstrated a delay of around two years. Here's those treated for just 14 days with teplizumab, a, de a delay in developing diabetes compared to the red line, which is those who receive placebo. And when followed out to five years, as predicted, uh, uh, over 80% of the placebo group had developed type, uh, type 1 diabetes, had gone to stage 3. We mentioned that that drug had been taken to an FDA advisory panel in 2021, and the panel had voted in favor of, of that drug being supported, and that had gone back to the FDA. So at that time, I described that if you want to compare the development of prevention of diabetes with the dimension development of powered flight. There was the first move in powered flight, but I think we are more effective than that. We've probably gone as far as here, this, uh, this landmark in powered flight where they managed to cross the Atlantic uh, about 24 years after the first plane had actually flown just 120 feet. I don't think we've got the whole field as far as this, for example, uh, supersonic flight, but we're certainly making progress. So with that background, what's new? Well, we mentioned this um, study, which was the first prevention study with the drug teplizumab. That's been reanalyzed following the participants for longer. And it's now realized that not just a 24 month, but actually closer to a 32 month delay on average can be calculated. So here they've followed the participants out to six years now. And you can see that 22% of the placebo group are diabetes free whereas 50% of the teplizumab group, and it looks like some of them might have a very long period of time when they don't develop diabetes or maybe don't develop diabetes at all. Important to remember with that drug that they were only treated once at the beginning for 14 days with the immunotherapy. Secondly, the American Diabetes Association has now taken on that staging of diabetes, so it's if you like official, this idea of stage one, stage two with dysglycemia and autoantibodies, and stage three. We've floated the idea of considering that stage three might be divided into a very early stage three, when you have early type one diabetes and not requiring insulin, as opposed to a later 
honeymoon phase, if you like, where you do require insulin, but you have a pretty good C-peptide level and a low risk of ketosis. And then finally, stage three, which is the a level that we're used to with very little remaining C-peptide and a high risk of ketosis. And we're beginning to see cases now, certainly referred to our service, which might be considered to be stage 3A, such as the first one here, a 28-year-old man with a BMI of 25, um, who had an insurance medical, and they measured his HbA1c and found it to be 51, or uh, closer to around 6.8%. Um, he had quite a high level of C-peptide, but was strongly positive for anti-GAD antibodies. And this looks like it is truly stage type 1 diabetes, but again, not at a stage where he needs insulin. And below is a, is a case of a nine-year-old girl in a similar position, but tested because her brother and mother had type 1 diabetes. So it's likely that as more testing happens, and certainly as teplizumab is introduced, we'll pick up more and more individuals at this early stage of type 1 diabetes. Another development over the last year is, is addressing the question of whether tight control at diagnosis preserves C-peptide, preserves beta cell function. And this was a study comparing closed loop therapy um, with a control group of intensive therapy in, uh, from diagnosis, within 10 days of diagnosis of type 1 diabetes from Roman Havorka's group in Cambridge. As you can see on the right-hand side, they did get very good levels of HbA1c control, and it was better in the closed-loop pump therapy group. However, overall, over the 24-month period, there was no advantage in terms of C-peptide level. In fact, if anything, the closed-loop group had a slightly lower C-peptide level. So it's a bit disappointing, but it does emphasize that glycemic control alone is not sufficient to preserve beta cell function. We're now extending the number of agents that have shown some evidence of um, preservation of beta cell function. When I talked last time, we mentioned the first six here, which have shown uh, evidence. Anti-CD3 or teplizumab is the, the top one over here. And I'm going to mention two for which we have evidence now, imatinib and verapamil. And then there's reports coming out in the next six months or so on all of these other agents. So we may be able to extend our collection so imatinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and um, it has effects on the immune system. It actually also has effects on insulin resistance. So this was trialed in new onset type 1 diabetes. So this is not prevention. This is new onset type 1 diabetes, but that's where we begin to test the drugs. On the left is the C-peptide, and the drug was given for just six months. And then the patients were followed for 12 months. And during that period of time, there was a significant um, improvement in the blue line in the blue line here in the imatinib group, although it declined over the 24 months after stopping the therapy. On the right hand side, you can see the adiponectin levels, and the adiponectin levels on imatinib were much higher than they were on, in placebo, and then declined after stopping the therapy. And this triggered uh, greater insulin sensitivity, and that can be seen by the fact that the insulin doses were substantially lower in the imatinib group compared to the placebo group. So this is another form of its immune therapy, but it also has an effect on insulin sensitivity, and that allows the beta cells to be effective for longer in terms of controlling glucose, or you need less insulin. A second new agent, well, it's not new, it's been around for 50 years, is the calcium channel blocker for rapamil. And over the last couple of years, this has been trialed in new onset type 1 diabetes. Why has it been trialed? Well, the evidence suggests that by blocking the calcium channels, the L calcium channels, this, these calcium channels are important for the adverse effects of high glucose and also of cytokines or inflammation by the TLR4 receptor. And this operates by the TixNet pathway, which is a, a pathway that's designed to protect against um, high redox potential or oxidative stress and eventually resulting in apoptosis. So the evidence suggests that although verapamil is not immunomodulatory, it does protect the beta cells from inflammation and also ultimately from hyperglycemia as well. And the first study was presented in uh, um, a couple of years now back when they presented the first year of data, which is shown here, the red line, 
and this is the peptide level, suggesting that those taking Varacmil, this is just a standard tablet, uh, once a day, uh, up to about 360 milligrams, had a better C-peptide level compared in black with placebo. And here I'm showing you the follow-up data which has been published uh, this year, showing that if you stop the therapy, things get worse. Um, but if you continue the therapy, you continue to get benefit. And here it's showing that they needed less insulin, so a lower insulin dose. And on the next slide, this was the original paper in 2018, showing less insulin dose, but also a lower HbA1c, less hypoglycemia, and bottom right, more time in range. So this seems to be a useful agent as well. We've conducted an analysis of bringing together um, almost all of the recent new onset studies as shown here, listed here, in the Tomi T1D collaboration along with the, the CPAT Institute in Arizona. What that's allowed us to do is get the largest number of people, uh, subjects in this analysis, nearly 2,000 subjects. On the right-hand side, you can see the intervention group in blue in the positive studies, and there were eight positive studies here, compared to the control group and what you can see is the preservation of C-peptide over that period of time, although it's still declining. What we were able to illustrate, and that was hard in the individual trials, is in the green line, you can see the HbA1c in the placebo groups of the positive trials. And here in red is the, the, the intervention group in the positive trials. And now beginning to show you that the HbA1c actually improves within six months, perhaps even more earlier than that, in the positive compared to the negative trials. In other words, immunotherapy does have an effect on HbA1c and not just C-peptide, certainly in the new onset patients. And this is showing you if you model the effect from all that data, depending on how much you preserve the beta cell function. In the red line, if you preserve more than 86% of the beta cell function after two years, the HbA1c is in an excellent place two years later. If you don't do that and you preserve less than 36%, like in this purple line, the HbA1c will begin to rise over that period of time. So that's evidence of metabolic benefit. But of course, if we go back now to talking about prevention, meaning getting at the early stages, stage one and stage two, that does mean that you have to do screening for the autoantibodies. And uh, uh, just to re-emphasize this part, that only 10% of cases come from Farrelly's. So if you want to find everybody, you have to screen the whole population because 90% of cases are sporadic. However, there is a benefit in screening, particularly in the prevention of diabetic ketoacidosis, because the, the, the young people know that they're at risk of type 1 diabetes, and that reduces the prevalence of type 1 diabetes, of diabetic ketoacidosis and admission to hospital. This year was published uh, the first review of efforts to look at general population screening. Up until now, it's just been screening of relatives and more of this is happening. I think you'll hear more in the coming years of these efforts at screening the whole population. But here's analyses looking at that effect on DKA and hospitalization rates. On the right, showing a dramatic reduction in the DAISY study of from 44% to 3% admitted to hospital at diagnosis. And this is DKA rates across three different studies here, showing a drop of up to tenfold in the DKA rate because the patients know that they know what to expect. We've had a couple of new studies um, published in the last year looking at better ways of screening. And this was a large uh, analysis of almost all the prospective trials following 6,722 children at genetic risk, either because of familial risk or because they've then been screened with HLA markers to show that they've got the highest genetic risk. And that usually identifies around 10% of the population who's going to develop diabetes. And that's exactly what they saw. 672 of them developed type 1 diabetes. And they looked to see when the autoantibodies appeared. And it seemed that the best way to pick the people up who were going to develop the diabetes, or one in 10 who are going to develop diabetes, was to do a screen at two years and six years. An alternative is to screen just once at four years, but you would miss more of them. By screening at two and six years, 
they estimated that you would pick up 80% of the, the children who were going to develop diabetes by the age of 15 years. There's still, of course, a group that are going to be missed. But those are a group that could be put into therapy. And at Azigo's group have also explored um, algorithms to work out in that early stage who's going to progress. And they identified that early rises in the sugar levels in an uh, oral glucose tolerance test, uh, the HbA1c and positivity for particularly the IA2 antibody were important. And they developed this slightly complicated um, formula. Uh, but using this formula, they were able to predict in blue much more accurately those in stage one who were going to progress over the next two or three years compared to those who weren't going to progress. And that's quite important in being able to know who to intervene in. There are quite a lot of risk indices out there now. I'm just showing you these two in the bottom line. There's the Diabetes Prevention Trial Risk Score and Index 60 that are used. People have used AUC, AUC glucose, CGM-based metrics. But I just wanted to mention um, more work that we've been doing in this area to try and develop this further. There's been a, a recent publication on Index 60, also showing an ability to, to predict. So the higher levels of Index 60 in red predict more effectively than the green or the black. But really, all of these are just using area under the curve C peptide, when, as we know, insulin is secreted in two phases, uh, and it's not a kind of linear rise in C peptide over the two hours of an oral glucose tolerance test. So, with colleagues um, uh, Claudia Cobelli's group, we've been looking at their, their what they had developed as the oral minimal model, modeling this two phases of secretion and actually insulin sensitivity as well. Uh, and being able to replicate that by the data from the oral glucose tolerance test. This is just showing you the phases of secretion, those where the granules are ready to go, and those where new synthesis of, of granules is required. And then obviously the effects of insulin, its clearance and its insulin action. So they've modeled this together um, in quite a complicated mathematical model called the oral minimal model. And this now measures gets out of an oral glucose tolerance test um, two measures of secretion, a dynamic or early phase secretion, and a static or late phase secretion, and insulin sensitivity, and then you can combine the two with what's called the disposition index. So we look forward to beginning to do this kind of analysis, perhaps, and getting even better predictors of people whose beta cell function is declining. So. I want to say a little bit about what you do now if we screen people that are autoantibody positive. How do you look after them? Because they're not going to develop diabetes for some time. And there's a lot of work in this area, but there's still more to be done in managing stage one diabetes. So here's a proposal that we've made that, the that when you have two antibodies or more, double antibody positive, those are the people who are going to progress, that we might then have a consultation at that point and measure HbA1c and random blood glucose and do those at three monthly intervals, as shown here. And if they begin to rise to being more than 41, or there's a 10% rise in HbA1c, or the random blood glucose is more than 6.0 millimoles per liter, um, then that's a moment when we go back to the nurse or the doctor, and they should be referred to the specialist team and begin to prepare for insulin or an insulin start. And that way we can gradually identify the people progressing and begin them on insulin without the risk of being admitted to hospital or developing ketoacidosis. New designs are beginning to develop in clinical trial designs. And this is a paper um, we published with colleagues recently, thinking about innovative designs. And in, in many areas, such as oncology, people are talking about adaptive trials. And we're beginning to do trials in that way. You have a master protocol, and then you have several arms using shared controls. So here's one in which we're now looking at verapamil and then looking at verapamil in combination with other drugs, such as teplizumab that we mentioned, a drug ATG, which has shown effect, and a batacept, which has shown effect. And this is a, a clinical trial in, in planning. And then after nine to 12 months, you can analyze the interim data and drop arms that are really not showing benefit. 
In fact, you can then combine trials. So here is a rather complicated slide, but above is the trial we just described. But in parallel, we've begun already comparing verapamil with placebo to replicate the earlier data. And then those on verapamil alone can be used as controls for the larger study. So these are ways by which trials can share controls and be more efficient in terms of testing new immunotherapies. Finally, the question, of course, is, is teplizumab going to be licensed? We mentioned that it went to the FDA um, last year, and we should be hearing on the 17th of November whether it has got a license in the United States. And this was a, a press release recently um, showing that Sanofi had entered a deal to, to launch teplizumab if it actually is licensed. So suggesting that there's going to be a lot of support for this drug if the FDA approve it uh, very shortly. So in conclusion, the ADA has now accepted the staging of pre-T1D, stage 1, 2, 3. 14 days of treatment with teplizumab in stage 2 has been shown to delay the onset of type 1 diabetes by more than we thought, now 32, nearly three years of delay. And this is the first drug that may be licensed but soon by the FDA. Imatinib and Verapamil have shown some promise as agents that can preserve beta cell function and add to the collection that we have. Combined analysis provides evidence that retaining C-peptide reduces HbA1c up to two years. Population screening, not just relative screening, is being planned. And we're seeing soon adaptive platform trials, which allow us to test the immunotherapy drugs and the prevention drugs much more rapidly. Thank you very much.